all right good night and now uh, we're moving on to work energy and power energy and energy transformations now energy is defined as a capacity to do work the unit of energy is a jewel sometimes we use killer jewels as well all events occur due to the transfer or transformation of energy energy is sometimes referred to as being in different forms a change in form of energy is referred to as a transformation now the forms of energy okay so you have kinetic energy you have potential energy on the kinetic energy you have thermal energy which includes energy of moving particles which provide which produces heat mechanical energy is energy of objects in motion so doing things electrical energy has to do with particles like electrons moving through a wire and magnetic energy is energy causing push or pull to occur okay and now you have potential energy which is known as stored energy so that's the opposite of kinetic energy kinetic energy means doing now with stored energy you have four basic types which are um, chemical energy which is stored in food or fuel you have elastic energy which is stored in objects that are stretched like rubber bands springs things like that um, nuclear energy which is stored inside of the nucleus of atoms and then you have gravitational energy which is energy stored in an object when it is above the earth's surface okay? so you also have sound energy which is a form of energy that we could hear and then you have light energy so you have one two three four that stand alone and then you have types of kinetic energy and you have types of potential energy and they're all energies just that we know with kinetic energy you have thermal energy right and then you have mechanical energy and then electrical energy and then magnetic energy so they're all parts of kinetic energy so when we say something has kinetic energy it describes either of the four ones that are demonstrated here whenever you have said something has potential energy it's describing either of the four energies that's described here so for instance if you say mm, an elastic band has potential energy we'll say yes but then if we say to expound or explain, you would say it has elastic energy, right? Or you could say that, hmm, food has the potential to give you energy. Yeah, that's totally correct. And if I say, well, what type of energy? Then you would say chemical energy, right? Yay! So, pretty much. We know sound energy is the ones that you hear, form of energy, which is the vibration of air. And light energy, form of energy that our eyes can detect. And we see light energy from the sun from the light that's beaming in my face right now right so all of that now with kinetic or potential energy we can calculate them and we have two exam we have two formulas two separate formulas so for for kinetic energy we use mv squared divided by two right or you could say half mv squared but to make it easier i would always put it like this for the kids i say hey Yes, it's a half mv squared. Yes, it's a half mv squared, but guess what? Sometimes you tend to forget how to calculate that. And so we say, huh, you know, it's ek equal to mv squared all divided by 2. Because a half times mv squared is exactly that. So you want to remember mv squared divided by 2 because sometimes the half, people forget the half. So we say mv squared over 2. Now with potential energy, that is the mass times the gravity times the height. Mass would have units of kilograms. Gravity would have units of meters per second squared. And height would have units of meters, right? The uh, same thing goes to the mass in kinetic energy. would have units of kilograms. And velocity will have units of meters per second. At some point, potential energy would be equal to kinetic energy or vice versa. Right? Because remember, the energy that you store up is the energy that you're going to use. So for instance, if you're standing still, you contain potential energy to run if you're going to run. You contain the potential energy to sit if you're going to sit. Right? So at some point, 
you have potential energy equal to kinetic energy same here kinetic energy equal to potential energy right and that's just before the action takes place right uh, while the action is taking place as well so here we have a question it says straight following questions now we know that the two equations i'm going to write them here so we can remember now that ep is equal to mass times gravity times height and that ek is equal to mass velocity squared over two right this is calculate the speeds at a one kilogram mass and then a two kilogram mass a coconut will reach when falling to the ground from 25 meters high what do you notice so you want to calculate the speed right so we know if we use ek the speed is only obtained using the equation ek right and if you notice that potential energy doesn't have speed however you're given mass and you're also given height right so if you give a mass and height, then you could more than likely solve for velocity. Because remember, EP is equal to EK, right? So we know here that, well, so we're going to say, hmm, we have the mass. So we're doing it with the one kilogram, the one kilogram coconut. And then we're going to do the two kilogram coconut over here. So we say the mass is equal to 1 kg. We know gravity, we take that at 10 meters per second squared. And then we have the height, which is 25 meters. And we look at the units, and we have the units in what we want. And then we have kilograms, we have meters, we have meters right here. And for this one, we know that the mass of the coconut is 2 kilograms. We know gravity is 10 meters per second squared, and that you would have gotten from over here. We're doing 10 instead of 9.86 because it's easier, right? And then we also have the height. Where did I put a multiplication sign over there? Jumping the gun, as per usual, because I'm so excited to do calculation. All right, never mind me. Just a bit excited get like that so we have high height right there and we know we said EP is equal to EK right for both of them in this case because we want to find the velocity now you could work out EP right separately from EK but then you won't see what we're trying to get at here right and of course I expect you to be wondering Oh, you should know to do that practice 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 after you do about a hundred questions of this you're gonna realize oh that's how you work it out right so just follow through and then eventually I mean the questions you're gonna get gonna get easier and easier with time so we're gonna say hmm mgh must be equal to mv squared over 2 right and we're trying to solve for v right so we're gonna say we're not have a v square but v but I just put the circle around the square so we don't lose track. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna get rid of two and we're gonna get rid of two. Sorry, we're gonna put the two. So what we do on the left, we're gonna do on the right. What we do on the right, we, what we do on the right, we're gonna do on the left. So now our two is gone. Now we wanna get rid of the m, so we're gonna divide everything by m. And you see that we have 2mgh over m equal to v squared. That therefore will be the same thing over here because it's the same setup. So we know 2mgh over m equal to v squared. Now to get rid of the squared root, we multiply each side by a half. Well, we raise each side. So, so that, that's basically what's happening. One times a half, and then this times a half. Right? And so now we have V is equal to the square root of 2MGH over M. 
and we have b is equal to the square root and i meant to say square not square root but this is the square root sign so this will be 2m gh over m now guess what's going to happen we want to find out if they're going to both fall at the same speed knowing that they have the same mass right but if you look at it you realize that mass cancels out so if you realize you realize that mass plays no importance in how fast something falls from any particular height so if you know if you realize this then you should come up with the fact that something special is going to show up so let's see so if mass doesn't play an important role in um, things falling then therefore there's a feather I'm trying to draw it like a feather does a feather fall at the same time as a two-ton boulder that's what we want to find out, right? Does a leaf fall at the same time, right? So we have a bowling ball out here. We could say this is a bowling ball. And this is a feather. Two different masses falling from the same height. Do they fall at the same speed? Well, we'll explain that in a minute. Let's see if we get the answer now. So moving on, V would be equal to the square root of 2 times 10 meters per second square times 25 right and the same calculation would be here 2 times 10 meters per second square times 25 meters and what you end up getting is v equals to 20 times 25 500. Let's see. I'm not sure. Probably 500. 500, of course. Had it right. 500 meters squared per second squared. Right? And pretty much it's going to be the same thing here. V equals to. 500 meters squared per second squared and when you square root that you're going to get 22.4 meters per second and the same thing here v equals to 22.4 meters per second do they fall at the same speed yeah they do a one kilogram coconut and a two kilogram coconut apparently falls at the same speed. This is evident in a place that has air because these things are they have density and they're round and so they could resist a lot of air, right? However, why we don't see this with a feather and a bowling ball is simply because of the orientation and the fact that air can get under the feather easier than the bowling ball. The way the bowling ball is shaped, it can, it's, it's first of all, it's spherical and it can pass through the air easier. So it would fall from the top of a, of a surface to the bottom much faster than the feather. The feather is lighter, so it would have to come back here. However, if these two were, were dropped in an area that was airless, and then it would make it a fair fall because then the feather wouldn't have to come back here. Remember, this is shaped better, right? This is shaped better to come back the air. So in an area that is airless, if you drop these two things at the same time, they will fall at the same time, right? And you can view videos on YouTube showing this. Just look up bowling ball and feather and you will see this happening in real time. Okay, all right, so prove that. Now here says, try the following questions. An Airbus A380 jet aircraft 
has a fully loaded mass of 550,000 kilograms. It can travel at a height of 12 kilometers with a speed of 250 meters per second. How much kinetic energy does it have? So we know that EK is equal to mass times velocity squared over O by. Must have made a mistake on the next page. I forgot to square. They have to square. Oh, I did that correctly. Ah, so mv squared over two. So we know that we have mass. This is our mass, and we have our height. But we have to convert this to meters. So we're going to say twelve. And the kilo is 10 to the 3, so it's 1, 2, 3 meters. And then we have our speed. So we have our height, we have our speed and everything. We don't really need the height right now, we just need the speed. So we're going to say 550,000 kg times 250 meters per second squared divided by 2. I'm going to put that in my nifty calculator. Alright, so the speed turned out to be 1.7 times 10 to the 10 joules. Right? So this will give us um, kilogram meters squared second squared which represents a joule so you're pretty good and then it says how much gravitational potential energy does it have so we're going to say ep is equal to mgh so the mass is this gravity is 10 meters per second squared and the height is 12,000 so in this case, we're trying to see if the kinetic energy used was all of the potential energy that was stored, right? And if it's more kinetic energy, then we know we went wrong. Because how much energy I have stored, you can't use more than that. Otherwise, the plane would smash it, right? So let's see. Times 10, times 12, 1, 2, 3. And that is... Total meters one, one, two, three, ten, one, two, three. All right, so it's six point six times ten to the ten. So you use more, you use more. Wow, so you use more. Oh, yeah. So therefore, yes, I'm correct. So therefore, the kinetic energy is less than the potential energy that was stored up to be used. So you are correct, my dears. Yeah, so 6.6 times 10 to 10. And it only used approximately 2 times 10 to the 10 joules um, to fly, which is good. Now let's talk about energy transformation. So I hope those little bit of calculations help and note that um, I am going to try to start another playlist where I do just questions and I'm gonna label the question I can say questions based on energy questions based on this question based on that because I think that's really what you need to learn as well how to work out questions I'm also gonna try to do another playlist on how to study and what works best because everybody studies differently but I know what works best for a lot of students that have taught for a very long time and so yeah anyway so energy can be transferred from one form to another which makes it very useful microphones have been invented to achieve this the chain sound energy to electrical energy where low speakers do the opposite Belts, chains, or gears are often used to transfer energy between moving paths. So here we have an example of energy interconversions. For instance, when you're using a battery-operated radio, 
you have the battery using a lot of chemical energy. I remember that. What type of that? What type of energy is that? That's potential energy going into kinetic energy. And so we have chemical energy, which is potential going into kinetic energy, which is electrical. And electrical is what particles moving through wires. And then we have sound. Then in computers, we start off with the computer. I put a desktop there because with laptops, it would be a little bit different. But then you could also say laptops get charged. But if you want to talk about a laptop that's running on battery alone, it would start off with chemical because you'd be using a, a one of those lithium ion batteries. So I use a desktop because that would almost always be connected. I've never seen a desktop that's not connected i don't know maybe i'm old time but anyway so electrical will be the wires and you would hear some sound when you go beep beep boop 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 beep boop then you can see the light and then you see you feel the heat coming out from the processor the cpu and then now we have um nuclear plants and this is a schematic for the nuclear plant so we start off with a nuclear reactor and we have a chain reaction of um, we would have a chain reaction right here of um, nuclei. We start with a parent nucleus and then a chain reaction going off in the nuclear reactor. And this will cause the heating up of the water. If you can see here, water is being pumped in. And it comes in here where it is heated up. And it's the steam is then passed through to turn the turbines, right? which causes the generator to work and thereby providing a lot of um, electrical energy. We want a little bit of nuclear um, radioactive elements you need to generate a whole city, right? So that's why a lot of places prefer that. Well, not a lot of places. Let's just talk about places like Japan. They use this, but it's, still, it's not good. And the reason being is that um, it's not good if anything happens to the station like if you have a crack or anything like that it's not good because then you would have radioactivity happening like all the all this stuff passing through all this stuff passing through like radioactive um what do you want to call that oh i tend to forget my words sometimes but you would be exposed to radioactivity, right? And then you have the cooling towers, which would then keep the steam turbine cool. Right. Yeah. Right. And it causes the steam also, not keep the steam turbine cool, sorry. It causes the steam that's in here to condense and condense back into liquid water, right? And that's how the water is just recycled throughout, just recycled throughout, right? So you have your cooling tower, your nuclear reactor, and all that, everything works together. This is probably the safest part because you wouldn't have any radioactive um, exposure. So, yeah, so you have nuclear, then we have some heat, kinetic energy, which is the turbines um, turning, and then you have electrical energy which is the energy being, which is the particles, the electrons passing through the wires, right? So you know, the generator, well, we're going to learn about that in electricity, how the generator operates and why it's necessary for a steam turbine to um, help the generator to work. Now we have solar energy. Solar energy is produced by the sun. It's produced on the sun by nuclear reactors so whereas in this case with a nuclear station we have nuclear fission occurring in uh, solar energy we have nuclear fusion right and so this is where small atoms join together to make bigger atoms the problem is that to get these small atoms to fuse together it requires a lot of energy so you don't really want to spend more money than you're trying to save. You get what I'm saying? You want to spend less money and save more. Anyway, one day they'll get it worked out and stuff. But this one produces cleaner energy. There's no nuclear waste. 
it's clean as a matter of fact helium is what's produced from um, the isotopes of hydrogen remember the about isotopes so helium is what's produced and the thing is helium we breathe it in every day it's inert it doesn't affect us it's great you put it in a balloon for balloons to float and guess what life is ah you start to when you breathe it in when you inhale it in your, through your mouth and with helium you tend to be like this right so that's the problem with nuclear fusion so nuclear fusion is great it's just that it, it would cost way too much to cause those to nuke those to nuclei to fuse that's why it works well on the sun because the sun is extremely hot and if we have to produce those kind of temperatures to get that type of energy then it's fruitless now we have a nuclear power station so i would have explained some of this a while ago but this is this, this is exactly what's happening inside of the nuclear reactor so a nuclear power station, what they use is a large uranium-235 atom, which is split upon, the, upon it being hit with a neutron. That neutron splits the larger nuclei, the nucleus into two daughter cells, two daughter nuclei, and they are very unstable, and in them being unstable, then you have neutrons hitting them, and causing more energy to come out basically it becomes a chain reaction right the only thing that's prob that's problematic with this is that it produces heavy elements like, like things that are like barium it's a heavy metal right krypton so all of those you want you tend to want to run away from um heavy metals and radioactive um radioactive DK? I can't even find the word. My mind is all over the place tonight. But being exposed to that is not good, right? So with the conservation of energy, in all energy changes, the principle a law of conservation of energy is found to be true. It is stated that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred from one form to another. Conservation of energy. If it seems in a transfer that some energy has disappeared, the lost energy is often referred to as heat energy. When a brick falls, its potential energy then becomes its kinetic energy. As it hits the ground, its temperature and that of the ground rises. The heat thermal energy of it rises. And of course, a little sound is heard and all that. So in practice, some thermal energy is produced in all energy transformation. Think about when you run. You go from potential, and then you remember, the potential means that you have stored up energy like in the form of chemical energy. If you don't eat, running will be problematic. Running will be problematic, you get a headache, all that. And then you start running. And then you start to make noises like, hoo, hoo, hoo. So that's part of the conversion. And then you start to get all hot. And you know that after a while you slow down and so you become um, potential again, right? Because you need to sit down, you need to let that lactic acid in your muscles break down so that you don't feel that pain. And you could do it all over again. That's why people who, ex well, people who try to run for the first time, they're either going to keep doing it because some people get runners high and they're those people that are like, hi, from one running? <sniffs> Miss me with that. Okay, so yeah, so here are some sources of energy. We need to get energy, right? And we have farms of energy, now we have the sources of that energy. Now. So there are many sources of energy as it is a necessary raw material in the world. So first we have that divided <coughs> into two groups. They have renewable energy, they have non-renewable energy. Renewable energy means that it's not gonna run out in our time. But it seems like it's not gonna run out in our time, we call it renewable. Because we all know that nothing lasts forever. But in our time right now, we know that we call solar energy, hydropower energy, which is basically water and wave energy, 
um, biomass energy, which is where you get um, biodegradable stuff, you store it and you obtain the gas it gives off. Geothermal energy, which you get from under the ground, and wind energy, all of that can be renewed. It's ongoing. For us right now, it doesn't seem like water energy would ever die out or go away. It would seem like the sun is going to shine forever and ever. And because we keep producing waste, because you get bio energy from basically poop, that's what it is, and you put it in one of those digesters and you keep it there, you, 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 you obtain the methane gas that comes out. So it seems like it'll never go away, right? However, with non renewable energy, those things, um, they can be used up. Right now, we're running out of oil. They say we have so many years or whatever, but who knows? That's why there's a race to who can make the most sustainable equipment off of renewable energy. That's why they would like to encourage farmers and agriculturalists to live on sustainable farms, meaning that they don't want you to be relying on fossil fuels and coal and nuclear energy. And when nuclear energy comes from the soil, eh, that's the uranium we found in the earth. And natural gas is also found in the earth. So these things that took millions of years to um, farm have been basically almost used up, right? So nuclear energy has the ability to produce energy at much cheaper f prices than fuel or coal. However, there are some problems associated with it. Come up with some problems as we flip over. Any problem? Right, right. So the cost of building nuclear stations are a lot. Um, if you want to get rid of a, a station, it will cost a lot of money for dismantling. Um, discarding of nuclear waste is a problem. Um, if any of these stations become ruined, like they start to suffer from cracks, or they become ruined by maybe a natural disaster like a hurricane, a tornado, or a tsunami, or earthquake, one of those natural disasters, if they become ruined, and then we have um, some, we, we detect some type of radioactivity leakage, then what is going to happen is that it's going to affect the entire area from agriculture to um, livestock to human life. Everything will be affected. And you could check up on the Chernobyl and the Fukushima um, examples of that where they have caught in our whole sections and the wildlife that stayed there then now being tested to see how much their cells would have mutated. Like the trees have mutated, wildlife has have mutated and if people stayed there, pretty sure they would have mutated as well. And I'm pretty sure some people suffered from um, radioactive burns and stuff like that. And that's not good. That's really not good. Now we're on to work. This is a whole other topic. So we went through um, potential energy, kinetic energy, and work is also a part of this topic, energy. Because when you're doing anything, moving and stuff, you're doing work, right? So work is done when a force moves. A boat pulling a water scare does work as it a crane when it lifts a load. However, no work is done in a scientific sense by someone holding a heavy pile of books are not moving anywhere, uh, you know. An upward force is exerted, but motion doesn't result, so we wouldn't say, oh, um, work was done. Because if I'm just holding this book, I'm not doing anything, right? So if a, builder, if a building a worker carries 10 bricks up to the first floor of a building, he definitely does more work than if he carries only one brick. And that's because he's exerting more force, right? He has to carry the bricks. Ten bricks would exert more force on the worker. So the amount of work done depends on the size of the force applied and the distance it moves. And we would have seen this equation in turning moments. Remember that? Force times distance. But this case, we're dealing with work pretty much the same thing. 
So the unit of work is a joule in that sense because work is being done. So therefore energy is being expended. And is the work done when a force of one newton moves through one meter? Right, so newton meters. And so since one joule is equal to one newton meter, then the newton meter is also equal to kilogram meter squared per second squared, which we saw in potential energy. If you lift a mass of three kilograms vertically through two meters, how much work is being done? Ding, 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 ding. Right, six. Because then we have work equals force times distance. Oh my. No, it's not six. It's actually 60 because it has to be in newtons, right? So to convert that, we just... We want to convert to um, newtons, you just multiply by 10. So now 1 kilogram equal to 10 newtons, right? So we we'll say <laughs> 3 kg times 10 newtons per kilogram. And why? Because um, I'll just let you know that gravity is 10 meters per second squared is also 10 newtons per kilograms and we deal with this when we're dealing with um, conversions of mass and we deal with this when we're dealing with acceleration like in the equation with potential energy and kinetic energy you'd realize in kinetic energy equation we use 10 meters per second squared because we're dealing with acceleration okay so acceleration is synonymous to gravity because when anything is falling towards earth is accelerating due to gravity right and we take gravity as being 10 of, well when we want to make our calculations easier we said 10 but it differs across the board but everyone is close to the number 10 right so we said that and then when we're dealing with weight when we want to convert all we do is just multiply by 10 newtons per kilograms and weight is affected by the pull of gravity on the object so to convert from kilograms to newtons, we just multiply it there, and then we have the meters. So now we know that it will be 30 newtons times 2 meters, which should be equal to 60 newton meters. Did you get that? That's so much. Alright, so this is probably going to be my longest video, but it's worth it. So here we go with power. Power incorporates energy per unit time, right? So, the more powerful a car is, the faster it can climb a hill. You ever, ever been into different types of cars? Like a buggy as opposed to maybe, uh, let's call my type of car, which is Toyota Camry. You, you're in a buggy and you just like fight into it. Kick, 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 kick. And then you're in like a car with more horsepower. Basically, you're just sliding up that hill. You're like, hoo, 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 coasting, coasting up the hill. Right, so that means you have more horsepower, but we'll get to that in a while. And so the faster it does work, so the more powerful you think of a strong man. A man that works out all the time, you know, and they eat well and all that. The more powerful they could do all sorts of things, they lift things up, run and stuff like that, and you don't even do a push up. It's just like, mm -hmm, I'm not doing that. So, the power of a device is the work it does per second. So the faster you do something, the more powerful you are. And that is the rate at which it does work. This is the same as the rate at which it transfers energy from one form to another. So power is actually equal to energy over time. Our work done over time taken. Our mass times gravity times height over time taken. And doesn't this remind you of EP? So power is equal to potential energy over time basically so you can say it like that but this here this here is that potential energy right mgh over time so we could use equation one equation two equation three basically just a breakdown a general breakdown as we move down the unit of power is the what and you might have seen that on top of a light bulb watt 75 and you could think of it like this if you buy a 40 watt bulb, bulb as opposed to a 75 watt bulb you stick them into so into the catch sockets there in your house 
and you're gonna realize that the 75 watt bulb is gonna be way brighter than the 40 watt bulb, right? So the unit of power is a watt and is a rate of working of one joule per second. So one watt is actually equal to one joule per second. So larger units are the kilowatt and the megawatt, where one kilowatt is a thousand watts, and we said 10 to 3 watts, and one megawatt is one million watts, because a mega is actually 10 to the 6, and a kilo is actually 10 to the 3, right? So that. Now, when we talk about machinery working, we want to talk about efficiency of that machine. How well does that machine work? A machine only works well if it gives off very little heat. So during energy transfer, some energy is wasted and lost to the environment. This wasted energy depends on the specific device, but there is always some heat loss. The efficiency of a transfer is a measure of how much energy is transferred usefully. Efficiency is equal to the output value over the input value times 100. Just note, if you're working out efficiency and you get a number greater than 100, then you're gone wrong. You've gone wrong out this. Because no machine ever gives you 100% efficiency. Okay? So... Just not if you get it wrong, if you get over 100, you get 116%, just switch the numbers that you have. So, it should always be the smaller number over the bigger number. If you don't remember the equation, just put the small number over the bigger number. Therefore, no machine is ever 100% efficient. So, if a machine has 500 joules of work in, if it does 500 joules of work in 10 seconds, its power is... 50 joules per second now you could write it like this or you could just write it like this because remember one watt is equal to one joule per second right so a small car develops a maximum power of about 25 kilowatts or 2500 watts i didn't even say what i i guess yeah so you're 2500 joules per second yeah that's what you're saying i should i should put a I should put a curly thing going, yeah, that which means 25,000 joules per second. So that's a lot of power in one second. So it says now try the following questions. And uh, it says a 500 kilogram load is lifted to a vertical height of 10 meters in 25 seconds by a crane. Calculate the power of the crane. So we have mass, we have the height. And we have the time. And we know that power is equal to energy over time. Power is also equal to mass since gravity times height over time. We have mass, we have height, we have time, and we also know what gravity is. Gravity is 10 meters per second squared, right? So we have everything. So we could just say 500. 500 kg times 10 meters what's going on? 10 meters per second squared times 10 meters <coughs> over over 25 seconds Feel like something going wrong somewhere. Five hundred kilograms lifted to a vertical height of ten meters. Oh, yeah. Okay, so I'm going to have to use the other unit for this. So let me... But if the units don't work out in your favor, you're going to have to see 
if to use the other unit. So in this case, we're going to use the other unit, which will be newtons per kilograms. Otherwise, you're going to have seconds cube, which is wrong. But that cancels carbs. Oh, and like I told you, when you have mass, stick the mass one in there. Even forget my own rule. So you put that, that, cancel out that, and now you're going to have, um, if 25 goes into 100 four times, then we have five one hundreds and it'll be twenty right so twenty times ten so twenty ten times ten is a hundred so we have twenty times a hundred so just add two zeros behind it twenty two thousand newton meters per second and a newton meter is a joule coming at one newton meter when you're doing work is one joule right so and then we know one joule Per second is equal to one watt and so we know that this would be 2,000 joules per second which represents 2,000 watts yay so we calculate the power which is 2,000 watts and then we run it through the calculator to make sure and did it so we have 500 times 10 times 10 divided by 25 yep Good. Now it says, how long will it take an electric motor of power output 25 kilowatts to lift a mass of 1,000 1, kilograms to 20 meters? So now we're looking long. How long will it take? We're looking at time. So if we have power equal to mgh over time, we want to find time. So we're gonna get rid of T, we get rid of P, put P where it belong, put T where it belong. And we're gonna T is equal to MGH over P. Therefore, we have the mass of 1000 kilograms. We have the gravity, and then we have the height of 20 meters. So we have all this. We have the height, we have the mass, and we have the power. So once you see kilowatts, it has power, but you have to always put things in watts. So since you have kilo, kilo is 10 to the 3, so that'll be 25,000. Um, and I wanna put Newton kilowatts, a watt, a watt is a joule per second. All right, let me just put a joule per second here because then I got rid. Let me just put the watts so that you could see it, and then I'm gonna write it in and then I'm gonna get rid of the and get rid of the watts for you. I'm gonna cancel out some stuff first. So, this gone with the zero here, we're gone with the zero here, and we got 25, and 25 goes into 104 times. So we're going to have 4 times 2 is 8, and we've got the kilograms going, so we have newton meters over watts, and we know that a newton meter is joules, and we know that a watt is joules per second, so we're going to say 8 times, 8j, times seconds over joules because that's what you do when you have a uh, um what you call it a fraction in the denominator and that cancels and you're back with eight seconds so that gives us the correct answer once you have the correct units you know you would have gone correct okay so that's why i tell my kids use your units okay so this is actually a lab that I do with my kids just to loosen up and to get to know each other and this is how we want to find out horsepower right so it says get someone with a stopwatch to find the time it takes to run up a flight of stairs the longer the better and you must find some flight of stairs right so you can have these stairs ooh, ooh. you can have these stairs maybe I should make this a two part series this is going to be two part boy, because it's kind of long. So you will have here 
stairs and then you're gonna have somebody you're gonna have a bunch of people and I will be the time because I want to make things sh make sure everything is done properly so you need one timer don't need 50 million timers because then next thing how this person read timer gonna be wrong for this person and all that jazz and then you're gonna measure the height of one step and then you're gonna count the rest steps one two three four let's hope for ten stairs right and maybe the height of one step will be let's say 18 centimeters you need to convert them centimeters to meters so you're gonna have 0 0.18 you multiply by at least 10 steps and now you have your height so you know you're gonna be 1.8 meters right so you know you ran a thing of 1.8 meters and then you're gonna get the time right because you want to calculate the power of that person you also need to capture the mass of the person so all you need to do is get a scale that measures in well hopefully kilograms if you get it in pounds you just go on your um, online calculator and convert from pounds to kilograms but get one that's in that can that already has this switch to go over to kilograms so it's easier and once you get the child where well, your, your friend or student mass you could put like let's say 55 kilograms right and then we all know we have the height and we know that gravity would be 10 newtons per kilogram and then of course each child's time will be different i would tell people to do it twice but that would be after the entire class ran you will come back a second time and then say you run up the steps in 2.2 seconds i mean you're really swift right your power would then be let's see 55 kilograms times 1.8 times 10 divided by 2.2 whoosh 450 watts right and so you want to convert that into kilowatts so you divide by a thousand that gives you 0.45 kilowatts you look at this and you say, oh, well, one horsepower is generally 0. Point, well, it's 0. 0.75 kilowatts. And to find your horsepower now, you would just equate them. 450 four, five, kilowatts. Put an X there. You just divide that by 0. 0.75 and you end up with a, a horsepower of 0. 0.6 right 0 0.6 horsepower so yeah you had a good horsepower 0 0.6 would be a horsepower so that's how you would do it but you have to actually do the actual exercise you gotta run up those stairs and you gotta do it twice and try to do it as fast as you possibly can and trust me it gets it gets even more fun eventually because people will be like huh Sarah faster than me no way i want it again but remember you only have two tries you could do it as many times as you want because class is about an hour and 20 minutes where i live and where i work T two times is enough i mean you see the times people are run up those stairs and plus people are young it's like 14 year olds 15 year olds 16 year old <sighs> you're young um if you have someone that is differently abled uh doing this running up the stairs is gonna present a challenge if they're wheelchair but they could do it you know they could do it they just have to be careful i wouldn't say hold out anybody from doing it if the person has the ability to go up the stairs then go ahead they just go up at a maybe a slow time or they might even beat you you never know so yeah cool friction so Friction is a force that opposes one surface moving or trying to move over another and it can be help it can be a help or a hindrance. Now friction also causes heat. It's a hindrance when you're dancing as a ballerina because you want smooth surfaces so you could glide, but it's a help when you are driving, right? If friction didn't exist when we were walking, what do you think would happen? Yeah, you will fall easily, bustle it, lose it too, chip it, uh, yeah, things like that. 
However, engineers try to reduce friction to a minimum in a moving path. So this is how you make, this is how you try to make uh, machines more efficient. That's basically why they bring up the word friction. To make machines more efficient, you add, you lessen the friction by lubricating the parts of the machine, by adding ball bearings and stuff like that. So when work is done against friction, the temperature of the body rises, like just rub your hands together right now. It gets really hot, right? So, yeah, pretty much. We have three questions and then we have machines to do. So we have three questions, let me get to it just now. So try it yourself, questions. How much work is done when a mass of three kilograms is lifted vertically through six meters? So work is equal to force times distance. And we say, yes? Good night. I'll come in now. I'll come in. So work will be equal to 30 newtons times 6 meters. And that will give us 180 newton meters. So 180 joules, right? So it says a lorry, a loading, in loading a lorry, a man lifts boxes each of 100 newtons, a weight of 100 newtons, to a height of 0 0.5 meters. How much work does he do in lifting one box? So this is now where you're starting to compare. Is he doing more work with one, with lifting one box, or more boxes of the same weight, right? So, we're going to say uh, work is equal to force times distance. And we know the force, force has units of newtons, so it's 100 newtons, times 0 0.5 meters. So that will give us 50, which is actually 50 joules, right? Then it says, if he lifts six boxes per minute, at what power is he working, right? So, now we want to know power. So, power, mass times gravity times height over time. So, yes, you have to memorize all of these equations. And you're only going to remember them if you do questions, okay? So, don't bother asking, they're going to give it on the exam, blah, blah, blah. They only give certain ones on the exam, one. Number two, if you learn the equations, you won't have to waste time flipping to the exam, right? So let's go. So the mass is, well, the weight is 100 newtons, so that's already worked out for us because mass times gravity will give us newtons. So we have 100 newtons. But remember, they said six of them. So we're going to have to multiply by six plus six things. And then we have the same height. They didn't change the height, which is 0 0.5 meters. And then um, he was doing it per minute. So we need time in seconds. So one minute is equal to 60 seconds. So we just put 60 seconds under here. Six golden is one, so 10 into 110 times. And we have five newton meters per second. And we know that a newton meter is a joule, so it's a five joules per second. And that will give us five watts. Because remember, one newton meter is equal to one joule. Um, one joule per second equal to one watt. So you have to remember all that. You just have to remember all that. So that's why I knew that Nm would be a joule, so I replace it. And uh, J over S is equal to a watt. So we have the correct unit for power. And that's why I tell kids, always use your your um, unit. So let me make sure I work this out correctly. Because I don't want to have to look over this video and be like, no. I have to do it over again. I hate doing over videos. Y'all don't understand. Man.
if you make videos you might understand but if you don't you don't understand it takes so much out to you i mean presentation alone presentation alone right anyway let's get a little in my feelings right there out of it so i think i'm work this out right and i know y'all would always pull up my pants for me when i get something wrong and be like hey uh, one thing to remember about me i'm just human but i will always admit my faults okay we don't know everything i am one teacher that will admit my fault if the teacher and say teacher this ain't look right and i'm not gonna be like hey, i think i didn't know i'm be like yo i was having a bad day i've honestly somebody really catch me in working out something incorrectly because maybe i didn't see it man i congratulate you you're smart you good you don't get that one right so an escalator carries 60 people of average mass 70 kilograms that means you have 60 people you have 60 people in an elevator and no i'm not gonna draw 60 people okay we have 60 people and each person in that elevator has a mass of approximately 70 kilograms so therefore we know we're dealing with 60 times 70 to a height of 5 meters in one minute by the power so we know power equal to mgh over time we have mass <coughs> we have 70 kilograms we also know that is 60 of those people right there so we multiply that 60 people 60 persons we also know how to convert mass to weight so we multiply by 10 which is gravity and we have the height which is five meters and we also know from the last question that one minute is 60 seconds and we know that from grade school but if you don't know that no you know and we say 60 right here seconds but guess what this automatically goes i know all we have to deal with is 70 105 and I would say 5 times 7 is 35, so that's 350. So you just add another 0 when you multiply by 10. And we have here Newton meters per second. And remember, 1 Newton meter is a joule, so we could just get rid of the Newton meters. And we have joules per second. And we know 1 joule per second is a watt, so we have 3500 watts. And Maison. Yeah, and so that's the end of machines. Now we're gonna, no, that's the end of work, sorry. So we did work and we did power. So we mix work and power together, right? And I hope that helped. And now we're moving on to machines, because our machines do, they make work easier, number one. And machines are complex formation of levers right good so let's see if we could do this in 20 minutes let's go so a machine is any device which enables a force the effort acting at one point to overcome another force the load acting at some other point and we have an example here we have a lever is a simple machine such as pulleys gears wedges screws and inclined planes um, such as simple machines such simple machines are used to build more complicated machines such as a crane as seen in the picture on the right we have force multipliers and distance multipliers these are types of levers so levers can be both either or sorry <clears throat> with a force multiplier the effort applied is farther away from the full command and the load and that's what we saw in the second class levers remember and so examples of force multipliers are four bars and wheel <coughs> and wheelbarrows. <coughs> and also bicycles, you know that, right? With a distance multiplier, the force applied is nearer the fulcrum than the load and so has to be greater than the load, but the load moves farther than the effort. Examples of distance multipliers are biceps, lifting something and a pair of tweezers
Now we fish and save a machine and we went to this a while ago and we didn't will work. The fish and save a machine is any machine that um, doesn't give off more heat than it works. So machines work easier or they make work easier but they do not reduce the amount of work that has to be done for a particular job. It just it's just that you wouldn't have to do it. If you have a great machine, you wouldn't have to do it. Like for instance, what could do? What could do? Lifting heavy things, we could go back to cranes. Lifting heavy things are tractors, tractors pull heavy things, things like that. So machines are not perfect because they are not frictionless and the moving parts are not weightless. Alright. So with machines, some work has to be done in overcoming friction and moving parts of the machine itself. And we learned that a while ago. We know that to reduce friction, we have to lubricate things and we have to make them seamless in terms of using ball bearings so they pass over each other effortlessly. Efficiency, pronounced eta, but it uses the, the symbol eta, right? Is defined as follows. Work done on the load, divided by work done by the effort times 100. I remember I told you that efficiency can be over 100, so once you see you get 100 and something, girl, boy, young man, young woman, kid, student, you are going the wrong way. So efficiency is usually expressed as a percentage and it's always less than 100. Just put the little number over the big number, say it and say if you don't remember these equations. There are three types of pulleys. You have single fix, single moving, block and tackle. In single fix, um, the pulley enables us to lift a load more conveniently by applying a downward effort. And you will see these a lot um, in movies with tree houses where they say, bring up the pail of water and you have the person attached the load there and the pull on one and the string and the pail of water go up on the pail of accoutrements whatever you want to call it and put it in the tree house right um single moving pulley if the effort applied to the free end of the rope is e the total upward force on the pulley is 2e right so since two parts of the rope support it right so this makes it much easier um, the weight in this case or the mass is moving along the rope and this way is not suspended on the rope, the rope and so you will have to give way to the rope on the other end, right? So the block and tackle now will be, the effort is 4E, right? Because it's now equally shared between 1, 2, 3, 4 pulleys and you have it the weight is suspended in between the two loops and you have to give it to the rope as it comes down. These types of pulleys could handle more weight than the other two. Right? Because they have more support here. So a load of 40 newtons is raised 0 0.5 meters by a pulley system when the effort of 10 newtons moves 2.5 meters. What is the efficiency? Remember that efficiency is usually a percentage. So we're going to have to work out the load. The work done by the load and the work done by the effort. And they already have the units there. So we're going to have 40 newtons times a half meters. And that will give us 20. I was just, just showing you how you're going to know how to work it out, right? So 20 Newton meters. And then the next one is 10 Newtons times 2.5 meters. And that gives us 25 Newton meters. So you just remember L over E, so load, because this is a smaller number. So we're going to just see by 20, by 25. Why do I have the units? Because they're going to cancel out anywhere. Well, let me put them in. Let me be a good person and put them in. And we're going to multiply by 100. 5 into 20 goes 4 times. 5 into 25 goes 5 times. 4 fifths of 100 is actually 80%. Well, yeah, because if you want to get this back to 100, you multiply by 20. And you multiply by 20 here. So you're 80%. Right? Yay! Right? Okay, so that is the efficiency, 80%. Is it less than 100? Pretty much, we are correct. 
So if we did it the other way now, we would have 20 being able to pass into uh, into 25. And with that one, you would have gotten a hundred and something percent. So if you say 25 divided by 20, you get 1.25 times 100 will give you 125 percent. So you know it would have been wrong right, right there. Now here we have another type of question, which pretty much to me, um, breaks it down. So you see how they didn't break it down for question one up here? They broke it down for question two. They said a load of 500 newtons is raised 0 0.2 meters by a machine in which an effort of 150 newtons moves one meter. Right? So I have the load and the effort. This is the work done on the load would be 500 newtons times 0 0.2 and of course we know work is equal to force times distance. I'm just press for space and that will give us um, yes something that still have to go so a hundred so we have a hundred newton meters and then of course we know this one gonna be a doozy because it's multiplied by one so 150 newton meters and we can just divide the small number by the bigger number to figure out efficiency and yes yeah, so let me put the etter right here so we know we're doing efficiency so newton meters over 150 newton meters times 100 and we go like that, go like that. 5 into this goes twice so this goes 3 times so 2 thirds is 66 percent I did a lot of um, fractions remember the math children's papers so approximately 67 because it's 6.6666 so it's actually 67%. <clears throat> Forgive me because I actually do a lot of corrections. So 67%. So we know which machine is more efficient in this case. The one on top, which is 80% efficient. Well, this one is 67% efficient. Right? So here it says an effort of 250 newtons raises a load. So we have an effort here, raises a load of a thousand newtons to five meters in a pulley system. If the effort moves, it'll try to trick it, it'll try to split it up. So we know that this is for this and this is for that right there. So you can say the work done on raising the load. So you know it's a thousand newtons times five meters. That will give us five thousand newton meters. Then it's the work done by the effort. <coughs> so it will be two hundred and fifty newtons times thirty meters. And that will give us three times twenty-five as well. Seventy-five, so seven fifty. No, seven five hundred newton meters. So two fifty times thirty, seven five hundred. And so we're gonna divide the smaller number by the bigger number. <coughs> give us 67 percent so is a bicycle a distance multiplier or force multiplier explain your answer um, carries us places so I would say this is a mixture because remember it's a complex machine so I would say it's both a distance multiplier so distance multiplier force multiplier I don't know you tell me I will call it a distance multiplier more than force because for me you don't want to put much force in you only gotta when you more feel the workings of a bike when you're going up um when you're going up a hill no
if I apply it, it's farther from the fulcrum than the load. So it's a distance multiplier in my book. Fight me on that, right? And here ended the lesson. Finally, we are done. All right, peeps. Man, see, this is good. I'm glad I got this done in time for term one. Pretty sure you're going to take the whole of term one teaching my fourth form as this. And at least I have a video here so I could reinforce the work. When they tell me they didn't understand something in class, I'll be like, no. Go to my YouTube video. Anyway, thanks for watching and see you around for my next topic. I don't know what it is yet, but I'm going to figure it out. Bye.